If you want to know the truth. I want to know the truth. You want to know the truth? Okay. <laughs> do. Well, give me the truth. You want to know the truth? <laughs> Boldness is truly the secret sauce of success. If you really have determination and the will to do something, you will do it. I think it's a question of, do you really want to do it? How badly do you want it? How badly do you want to work for something? These things require discipline. This is Jennifer Cohen. She's an entrepreneur, best-selling author, international speaker, and top podcaster. Now, when I say she's an entrepreneur, she sold her business for millions of dollars to Weight Watchers. When I say she's a best-selling author, she has three books out, including her latest, Bigger, Bolder, Better, How to Get the Life You Want. As an international speaker, her TEDx talk has over 5 million views. And as the host to the podcast Habits and Hustle, she sat down with people like Mark Cuban and Bobby Brown and celebrities like Dennis Rodman and Matthew McConaughey. But what makes Jennifer Cohen such a badass and what you're going to get a glimpse of in this conversation is that she has bold ideas and she doesn't take no for an answer. When I say chase what you want and don't take what you can get, most people settle for what's in front of them and they acquiesce to what's available versus being deliberate in what they actually truly want out of their life. If you want to live an exceptional life, you got to try to do exceptional things. If you want to live a mediocre for life, you do mediocre things. It seems like everything you touch turns to gold. How can you possibly say that you feel like everything that you've ever tried, you failed at? You kind of remember the wins and you kind of forget the failures, right? If when you do it so much, that's really the message, right? You get so comfortable with failing that when it happens, you just move on to the next thing. And to me, you're talking about all of my, you know, my quote unquote wins. But at the same time, those are wins intermittently placed, sandwiched in between a ton of failures. So, so you're saying if you just if you just stretch out life long enough, you can get a pretty good resume like you've had. <laughs> yes. I mean, you've still done some pretty badass things that other people try and strive for and, and, and come up short. I mean, there, there has to be a secret to what you do. Well, first of all, like you just you actually just said it right there, like that people have tried and strived for. My entire message and my entire philosophy is just that. I think that if people try enough times, they eventually get a win. And to me, what happens in my experiences or in my opinion, I should say, most people don't make an attempt. They don't try. And therefore, that's why they're not living the life that they want. They're kind of taking the life they get. And mm. why I wrote the book I did, you know, the Bigger, Better, Bolder book is more because I feel I want more people to listen to my message, to hear that I'm not any more special or greater than anybody else out there, right? A small town Canadian girl who the only thing that makes me different than anybody else is maybe that I pushed a few more times and tried and attempted uh, more times to get a win. And the reality is, that, and the truth is, that once you get one win, it gives you the confidence to go and try again for another win. And in my opinion, life is very much, to, it's like the law of inertia, it's momentum. Once you're in motion, it's easier to stay in motion. Once you're out of motion, that's when you have a problem. But I think what most people would think is, you know, when something's in motion, it stays in motion and they just see the car heading towards the edge of the cliff, <laughs> going right <laughs> off the edge of the cliff, right? So it's like, yeah, motion keeps you going, but it can keep you going the wrong direction, right? It, I mean, listen, I think there is no wrong direction. It can be just an accumulation of dots that you collect over time and you don't really know where that dot's going to lead you later on. There is this... uh I don't know what you call it. Is it, is it a proverb or pro? That's, have you ever heard of that story of the Chinese farmer? Maybe. I mean, there's a lot of Chinese proverbs. Why no, don't you Chinese share it with farmer, us? No, the Chinese farmer. But it's not, a, it's, it's not a Chinese proverb about a Chinese farmer? It is a, a Chinese a... proverb about a Chinese farmer. Okay. Let, me, let me tell you the story and then you'll see if you've ever heard of it. Okay? You're right. It is. Okay. So um, I'll make this really kind of, I'll try to, I'll try to make this brief, but there's a story of a Chinese farmer who had this wild horse that ran away. And when he ran away, the community, you know, this one, the community in the town were like, yeah, oh, oh my we're God. We're like, good luck or bad luck. And he right. said, he said, we'll see. It's, everything was, we'll see, because you don't know yeah. how one thing can. But could, I, I feel like for our audience, we should still share it, right? So the horse, what, the horse runs away and they say, well, terrible luck. And he said, we'll see. 
and then uh, his son has to work in the field and his son oh, gets wait, hurt. Oh, wait, okay, hold on a second. What happens is a wild horse runs away. The community yeah. comes to him and says, oh my God, how horrible. How can this be? This is your big, your, your champion horse. And the Chinese farmer was very much matter of fact and very, he, he was very stabilized and stable in his like emotions. He's like, we'll see. And then the next day, the wild horse actually comes back. And they're like, oh, my God, how lucky, how, how amazing that this wild horse come back. And the Chinese farmer still didn't really change his, like, temperament or emotion. It was still very stable. The next day, the kid goes on the horse, breaks his leg, and then they're back at the farmer, the, the community, basically telling him, oh, my God, how horrible, what a terrible wild horse you have. You should get rid of him. And then the <laughs> next day, the people come in to, like, you know, find the people to fight in the war, come to knock on the Chinese farmer's door to get the son, and the son had a broken leg, so therefore he didn't have to go away to fight the war. And so then they're like, oh my God, how lucky you are about the wild, the wild horse, because now your kid is safe. The point of the whole story is exactly what you said. Well, it's like you don't know how one thing affects another thing. So what may seem like a disaster or a failure in one moment in time can actually be a huge win if you just wait long enough. And so that's how I've lived my life, right? Like I don't think just because one thing didn't work out that things won't work out down the road. I just think of it as one dot in a whole big maze of dots. And I, I do love that. And we're going to get into your new book, Bigger, Better, Bolder. You know, I have a friend who said, Mark, when you, when you connect with Jen, like she wrote the book that you're going to have wished that you had written. And there is a lot in there that I'm like, oh, it's so good. And so we're going to dig into that. But Thank I want to take a step back. You have a podcast, as I mentioned, that has done amazing, remarkable things. So you're sometimes in my seat and you're with you know, Mark Cuban or Tony Robbins or all of these other amazing leaders and you're asking them the same questions. And all of them say the same thing. I've heard David Goggins even say this, like, there's nothing special about me. You know? And so you're, you're standing here and you're saying, well, there's nothing really special about me. And yet... Come on. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you again because it seems like when you were a kid, you're a pretty precocious kid. It seemed like you basically, I don't know what it was about you, but you just pestered people until you kind of got what you want. So, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's something, there's something, and I, I got four kids and one of them is pretty precocious. So like I'm speaking as a father as well. There must've been something as a part of you that wanted the bigger life than maybe Winnipeg, wanted to do more, wanted to make more money, wanted to be seen had a, this this inability to take no as an answer. Like there had to be something in you, right? Yeah, you know, I think this is true. It's so funny you say that, right? I, was pre- I wasn't so precocious as I was curious. And I think that's been the through line with my life. I think that I've always been extraordinarily curious about everything and about people. I was always very interested in like in human nature, why people do what they do, how they do what they do. And to me, being curious in life and being interested in people is really half the game, right? Half the battle, right? Because I think that's how you find out about things that you want, don't want, you get information, you can glean that from that information. And so to me, I just kind of leaned into that. But really, in the long run, that to me was really what maybe kind of set me a little bit apart from other people, because other people would not care as much or not be interested as much. Like, it would always be me going somewhere. And I would like laser in on one thing or one person and like, really develop a a real relationship with that person because I was asking them questions about them in a genuine, authentic way, right? Versus other people who never really cared that much. They kept everything very like topical and surface. I would rather have one person that I really got to know versus a million people that I didn't know at all. And that's number one, how you really build true relationships, right? When you kind of get below the surface in a genuine way. And It was always for me, like that was like one of the, that was to me, one of the step, real stepping stones in kind of fostering whatever success I had later on. When did you notice that? Was there a time or a certain memory where you're like, where where it hit you? I can recall in in high school, I had one of my teachers write in my, um, in my yearbook, because we used to send around yearbooks to get signed. And he said some very nice words about me, but he, he mentioned this one thing, you're a really quick learner. 
And I was like, ah, oh, and that like, snap. I was like, I didn't realize that I'm a quick learner that snapped into my identity. And then suddenly like, I'm a quick learner. I'm in, I don't know, grade 11 or 12 at this point. So it's pretty late in my high school career for me to do this. But was there a moment where you realized that <laughs> if you just, if you just ask people questions and they're on the point, people are going to answer them. And it's kind of different than what other people are doing. Yeah. You know what I find? Yeah. So when I, I learned how what, that I was, maybe sometimes people would say to me, I was, too nosy, you know, everyone oh, was saying to me that. as a kid, like, just, yeah, I'm so nosy. They would call it nosy. I called it curious, right? Because I wanted to know everything. And so they were just like, I just, the euphemism for nosy maybe is now curious, but I was, I was like, I would get in trouble in school all the time because I wanted to like talk and ask questions and like, you know, bond, like a bond with people. And, you know, I would go places with my mom and I would ask people like personal questions. And they'd be like, your kid is so nosy. Like it was never called curious back then. It was just called really nosy. And that's when I kind of thought like, hmm, that's maybe I am. But I made it work for me. Like I just kind of, ch- I flipped the switch in my head and I'm like, what they call nosy, I call curious. And I'm just going to keep, the I'm just gonna keep on going in on it. Like if I was to be honest, that's what it was, right? Like, cause like I was just some like, little kid always asking a lot of questions like that that kid's like nosy and they were very like negative about it like no one was ever like super like pop no one was ever saying it in a positive way like god that kid's super nosy and curious it was kind of like shunned upon like I should have kept in my place and been more polite and know my manners and know this but like it just wasn't my personality there you go. You leaned into it. Now, um, I, I know that in your in the TED Talk, which is an amazing TED Talk, uh, given a few years ago, has millions and millions of views and really kind of seems like the groundwork or maybe even the foundation for your book. You tell a story about, you know, up here in Canada, we have we had something called Much Music. And because uh, I grew up in Toronto, at, like in grade eight, grade nine, we would go down to Much Music. Like we would go down to Queen Street and we would put the quarter in and you know, for anyone who's Canadian, you know, we're very fond because there's like Speaker's Corner and it, yeah. the Bare Naked Ladies got their start there by playing like a song, you know, uh, Yoko Ono in there and stuff like that. But you, much music, the Canadian MTV had VJs. And I guess at some point as a teenager, you decide that it'd be pretty cool to leave Winnipeg and somehow become a VJ on <laughs> television. <laughs> Yeah, I loved it. Because again, you get to ask people questions, you know, like what I loved about number one, I always had like one of I love music. I always was I, I always had a passion for music. It was like something that I loved. And the idea of like getting to ask questions about an area that I was super interested in, like because in a you know, a, a VJ would, you know, you interview a bunch of musicians and people and you talk. It was like to me, it was like the perfect job right and so and you know being but, but Canadian, how, how old were you were job. you like were you like 17 18 you were 17 okay so but, but here's what I'm curious about because because the story is remarkable but a lot of people have a lot of ideas and a lot of people get excited and a lot of people have a lot of dreams but fewer people then start to flirt with the idea even fewer still start to formulate a plan in their head almost nobody puts the plan into action And it required you to do a demo tape. And so there's just so many roadblocks between it seems like a really cool job and you submitting a a demo tape and getting an audition and getting flying into Toronto and all the all the things that kind of happened that may have even kicked off your kind of television career and all of these things as a personality. But most people would just leave it as a dream or an idea and never even put in the work to it. Like, I know you you know that. That's exactly it, right? Like, Everybody, ha- like, who have you ever met, Mark, who doesn't have a dream or an idea, right? They're, everybody does, right? Like, even if they say they don't, they do. Everyone has it in their, even if they don't say it out loud in their head, there's always something that they would like wish they they want to do or they could do. And 99% is, is, is idea and like actually like 99% is the perspiration and the execution. Nobody does the execution. So yeah. in my head, right? So in my head, I think to myself, right away, if I just try to execute, I'm already ahead of the game because most people don't execute. They just, they keep it in their head. They think about it. They don't think that they are talented enough, smart enough, good enough, whatever enough. And so it just lives in their brain. But 
my whole idea was if, why not me? Like, if it can happen to so and so, why can't it happen to me? It literally is training your brain to believe in yourself. And, you know, I feel that it's, it may come across maybe arrogant, but it's not. It's like, it's a, it's really a question of if it can happen to Mike Smith or Jane Smith, why can't it happen to me if I just try? The worst that can happen is something doesn't work out or someone says no, but you don't know what you don't know. And I've always been much more afraid of the regret versus the rejection. I can live with the rejection as long as I know I tried for something. And when, even when I was a young kid, I, re, I was starting on that path before when I decided I wanted to be a VJ and, and do what I did for the demo tape, I was already practicing that whole mindset shift. And, and when we say do what you did for the demo tape, we'll just really quickly say that it included you semi-stalking Keanu Reeves. I wouldn't say semi-stalking. I would say... Okay, hanging outside of I a theater for Keanu Reeves. I would say created a circumstance in a situation <laughs> where I can not, meet not Keanu stalking, Reeves. Not standing outside <laughs> in minus 30 degree weather and getting frostbite. Simply engineering a situation in which 17-year-old <laughs> Jennifer, 18-year-old. an 18-year-old Jennifer can come in contact with him and say, you will make my career happen if you help me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I would say that I created an environment where I was able to ask the big question because, again, look, most people, to your point, would never have done that. How many people do you know would stand outside of the Manitoba Theater Center for two hours in minus 40 degree weather to get a glimpse at somebody like Keanu Reeves and, and ask him a question like that? Most people wouldn't do it. So if you're somebody who Actually, put yourself in that execution situation where you go out there and do something that you want to do and take away the fear, take away the self-doubt, take away the potential chance of rejection and do it. Listen, you you know, there's there's a shot. You know, have you ever watched, have you ever seen Dumber and Dumber? When like, they're like, there's a million, you know, would, you, would you ever go out when the girl or the guy says to her, like, would you ever go out with me? She says, no. And he's like, are you telling me there's no chance? And he gives her that whole thing. And he's, she's like, okay, one in a million chance I'll ever grow with you. So you're saying there's a chance. Like all you need is a glimmer of hope and potential, but possibility, hope and possibility can, can drive you really far away. And I thought to myself, like, listen, no one else is going to be doing it. I, if I'm the only one, like what's the worst that happens? I go home. He says, no, I, I then I, I move on to the next thing. No harm, no foul. But putting yourself in situations and creating possibilities for you to possibly win is how you win, right? You've got to be, you, if you want to live an exceptional life, you've got to try to do exceptional things. If you want to live a mediocre life, you do mediocre things. But that is the bottom line, right? I love it. I love it. It's so black and white. Now, another line that you wrote in your book that really caught me, I've heard you speak this before, but I chase what I want rather than take what I get. I chase what I want rather than take what I get. The idea is that you have a clear goal of what you want. You work towards it. You ask for it. Those who ask receive, as opposed to just kind of settling with either the easy thing or the status quo or not wanting to bother people and, you know, and anything else. And I love that idea. I suppose what I bump up against is one, I mean, You've just been told or it's been grilled into us like, you know, give before you ask, give before you ask, don't ask for things. You know, if you work really hard, you'll be rewarded. Someone will see you, someone will spot you. And so I know that those who, who make some noise, those who make bold claims and, you know, do really cool sh and back it up with action, we know that they get a, a disproportionate amount of attention and good things coming their way because there's less competition up there because frankly, fewer people are willing to be that brash or be that bold. It's just so damn uncomfortable when you start, isn't it? Yeah. And it will let me tell you something. First of all, I agree with that. However, I, it is uncomfortable, but you have to get over that discomfort. I believe that you're right and you're wrong. Like I think that people do say that a lot that, oh, you have to give before you 
get. And I'm a big believer in that. But it comes down to how you're doing everything, right? If you're a jerk about something, of course, you're going to lose. But it's about how and what, how you're doing it and what you're doing. And I let me tell you, I always lead with how I could serve and how I can help. I mean, if I told you how many people that I've done things for that I've gotten nothing in return, it's probably the list is much longer than the office and then the other way around. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people getting out of their own way. And what I mean by that is that when you're not taking what I, when I say chase what you want and don't take what you can get, most people settle for what's in front of them and they acquiesce to what's available versus being deliberate in what they actually truly want out of their life. Now, when I talk about that also, I'm not talking about material stuff. I'm not talking about buying a plane and making a a billion dollars. Those are all nice things to have. However, that doesn't really give you a rich life. And my whole message and my purpose is for people to live a life that's rich in meaningful relationships, in meaningful experiences, and in line with who they are. And to me, that's having to be deliberate on what and how, what you're going after. You know, like people are so like, you know, with dating, a lot of times people are settling for, and I talk about this a lot, like who asks them out? Right. So they'll just like go out with whoever asked them out and like, you know, they'll make it work because ask the person versus like really thinking, who do I want to go out with? Let me go ask that person out because they won't do that because either it's not appropriate in terms of the, you know, a girl should not ask a boy out. So I'll just sit back and whoever, whatever boy asks me out, then I'll just go out with him. No, or whatever gender and whatever, you know, whatever you like. My point is in life is to be intentional and chase exactly what's more in line with what you want out of your life. And that requires something called self-awareness. So the component of building and cultivating some self-awareness to know what that is and then to go after it, you'll live a life that's much more full and satisfying. As you were saying that, it actually, I, I had this image in my head of a conversation I had with an entrepreneur who had a lot of options in front of him. He could go into uh, products. He could go into, he, he had these toys and all of this IP. So he had toys and he had books and he had possible movies and he had television commercials and he had all of this stuff. And I said, great, what are you going to lead with? And he said, as soon as a prospect, as soon as a toy company or a television studio, as soon as someone tells me the thing I'm going to make money at the fastest is the thing I'll go all in on. And I was like, that's not how it works. Like you can't come up with five or six or eight things. And the reason this image came in my head is, is I think, you know, in the business setting, in the entrepreneurial setting, in the creative setting, we just want to know what the thing we should go all in on. And whatever that easiest thing is, whatever that low hanging fruit is, you know, I'll work with whatever customers want to buy. I'll sell whatever product people want to buy. I'll just like, just tell me what to do. And I'll go all, all in on that. And it seems so clear to me in that business setting, how wrong that is. Like you, you have to, to, to stake a flag in the ground. You have to say, this is who I am and this is what we do and these are our, what, how we help people and all of those things. Similar to your podcast. Uh, you know, when you, when you started, your, your podcast wasn't a podcast. It was a television show that kind of fell through and, and became a podcast. But it wasn't like you started by saying like, hey, uh, you know, TV people, like tell me, Whatever you'll buy is what I'll make. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 and it yeah, sounds yeah, so yeah. silly when I say it that way, but most of us live our lives, our relationships, our careers, our work, our hobbies, where we live, how we live. Our entire mindset is based off of like, just tell me what the easiest thing to do is and that's what I'll do and I'll go all in on it. And that's not how life works, right? Well, you're talking about the path of least resistance, right? And that's a lot of times what people do. They live on the path of least resistance by taking what's the most convenient around them. But then you're living a life that's just based on what's convenient and easy. And the truth is, if you want to know the truth, the truth is the most 
I want to know the truth. You want to know the truth? Okay. <laughs> I do. Well, Give me the truth. You handle the truth? The truth is the the things that are the most satisfying and rewarding are usually the most difficult, right? And that is a, a making that means making difficult decisions, making difficult choices, going zig when you should zag. You know, now I believe that, like I said, it requires self-awareness to know who you are, what you like, what you don't like, what you can tolerate, what you can't tolerate. And that requires you to do a lot of things at a certain period, you know, to try a lot of stuff and then know what it is. But I do believe that there's two things. I think you don't need to have your destination set out for you. You don't have to say, I want to be, I want only this. And therefore I'm not going to do anything except to get that. That could be very difficult. And that's not realistic. Right. What do you, what do you mean by that? Like, like I'm, I'm an actor. And if I'm not on Broadway, then it's, I'm, I'm a failure kind of thing. Uh, what I'm saying is you can't be that strict and regimented in life. So you pick a direction, not a destination. Know kind of where kind of you want to be and then like move and do that. If you're too regimented and too strict in that one particular thing, a lot of times what happens is you end up doing nothing because you just, unless it's the exact thing that you need. My whole idea is that, you know, pick a direction, not the destination and make 10 attempts at it. And you may not get that exact thing that you want, but another opportunity will present itself that you never even knew existed that will take you down a path that is at least in line with what you want. Like you don't know what you don't know, but it, and then see where it takes you. But just to kind of like take whatever's easy, I mean, in anything, in business also, you should be aligned with even who your customer is. Right. Like if you can't be everything to everyone, right, in business. And that's where a lot of people in business fail is because they want to be everything to everyone as opposed to being very specific and very uh, deliberate on who their customer is. Once you have that down and nailed, then you can kind of like keep, you know, you can expand. But when you're just kind of like blah out there and you're trying to like have everyone love you. Like not everyone's going to love you, right? There's like people have things that they like, not everyone's going to love my style. There'll be people who like me, there'll be people who won't, don't like me. Just how with you, there'll be people who like you who don't like you. Be okay with what? that. I don't, want, find your I don't want people not way. to like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Mark. I, can't, I mean, maybe if you're just a big people pleaser and then are you pleasing yourself if you're a people pleaser or are you just pleasing everybody else? Well, now, now we're touching on the stuff that you can see, start to see the vein come out of my head. <laughs> the sweat dribblets coming yeah. down. I love what we're touching on. And of course, you wrote the book on bold. On my wall, when we, when we jumped on the call, you said, I, I love the poster behind you, right? Think big, be bold, say yes. This was uh, something I, I came up with for myself in like 2013 or 14, because I realized that I needed not a mantra, but I realize that by nature, I think small, even when I think I'm thinking big, it's like, I'm just, I can't even comprehend how amazing the possibilities really are. And so if I don't push myself to think way bigger than what I think is possible, it's still way too small. And thinking big is awesome. I can think big all day long. I can write stuff. I can research stuff. I can talk to people. I can take them out for lunch. I can have podcasts. I can think big all day long. There you go. But, but then... You know, I'm not really taking any action if I'm not doing bold action. This came from a conversation I had with my friend Evan Carmichael. I went over to his, his condo and I was having a terrible time in my business. And I said, you know what? If I were really bold, I, and he would say, stop, 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 stop. I, I don't want to hear it. And I said, no, like if I were really bold, I would just, and he said, I don't want to hear it, Mark. I don't want to hear it. Because either you're going to be bold and you're going to do what you're about to say, or frankly, you're not going to do it, in which case I just don't, I just don't want to hear it, right? Like, I don't right. want to hear what you're about to say. Because he knew that I, would, that I knew the bold action I should take, but I just wasn't bold enough to necessarily do it. And that takes me to the third point, which is by nature, I tend to say no to everything. <laughs> like, everything seems too good to be true. Everything is like, and it's not that I, I say yes to, I try to help too many people. I am a bit of a people pleaser try to help a lot of people, try to make them happy. 
when it comes to my things, my growth, my plans, the things that are most important to me, I almost say no to everything by default because it just seems like it, a distraction and too much work and too scary. And my wife says, hey, you, I think we should go off and you know, go here for the weekend. I'm like, no, you know, like it's just... So, so I wrote, I developed this only because I know I need to think big and I know I need to be bold and I know I just need to say yes to things. Cause when I do those things, life is just like a lot more magical. It's a lot more exciting and I get closer to my goals. And so you wrote the book on being bold and there's so much that we can get into, but I want to start with why is boldness the answer to success? Well, I think from everything we just talked about, I think it's not necessarily the smartest person that wins is the person that is the boldest. Because what happens a lot of times when you're too smart, you overthink and you end up Guilty. thinking of all, right? And you overthink of all the things that can go wrong. But when you're bold, you think of all the things that go can go right and you and then you go and you and you act. And to me, boldness is truly the secret sauce of success. When you look at all these really, you know, real, a lot of successful people, it's like they didn't have all the answers when they started. Most of them had no answers. But the one thing everyone has and a lot of them have in common is they have a big idea and they go for it and they figure it out as they go. And they don't get stuck in analysis paralysis. And what we said earlier is once you go and once you start doing, momentum takes over and something, like I said, an action stays in action. And it's been my life experience that I was not exactly an academic by any stretch of the imagination. And to me, you know, I've had a lot more success professionally than a lot of the most brilliant people I went to school with because they were still, they're still sitting there thinking of all the different things that could have happened, not happened, or they didn't get comfortable with the failing that I did. Because when you don't rely on your, your academic prowess all the time, you have to build other things like build resourcefulness and scrappiness and grit. And all those other things that are so important in like real life, you know, in professional life, but also in personal life, right? Yeah. And to me, those are all the, that's like all the meat that's so important that it's not just about numbers. It's about, you can always find people to help you in these places, right? But someone has to go out there and actually go and get it and do it. And, you know, that's how I look at it anyway. And so that's, that's why, like I said, I wrote the book, I did the talk because it's how it's my philosophy in life and it's worked for me and I know it can work for anybody and everybody. Okay. So, so two thoughts. We often see younger people successful because they have the energy and mm -hmm. frankly, they're pretty dumb. <laughs> I don't mean that in a mean no, way. It's I started my agency when I was 20, I was 23 when I started my agency, my wife wasn't working and my newborn baby daughter had just been born and I went, I'm going to quit my job and start a company. Right. And, and it was like, ah, this, this won't be that hard. This won't be. And it was like, eventually I was like, oh my goodness, this is so hard. Oh, three years of grinding and going through the recession and almost exactly. going bankrupt and all of this stuff. So I was just like young, energetic and stupid. But as we get older, the boldness dissipates. You know, I heard someone once say uh, at a TEDx talk in Toronto, I heard someone once say, that they believe that, that we have this idea of like chips. Like there's a certain number of risk chips we can take in our life. And in our 20s, we're going to use up like half of the risk chips we can apply because we have time and we're willing to make mistakes and look a little stupid and whatnot. And we're just dumb. Right. But then in our 30s, we're like, ooh, I don't know. I, I, what, if, uh, what if these risk chips, if I, if I apply it here, if I quit the job I hate to go start this company and it doesn't work, I might lose everything. And so as we go and then into our 40s and then into our 50s, it's just like it right. feels like we just have less time and less ability to take on risk, which is totally a mindset thing. Like that's not even a real thing. That's a story we're telling ourselves. Well, I think, we're, I think people become much more risk adverse as they get older, right? And also based on more information. 
when you're young. It's, it's, it's weird though. You feel like you have more to lose, but in fact, and maybe monetarily you yeah. do, but what you discount is you have way more experience to lean on. You have a bigger network. You have more experience. I mean, even if you're, even if you're changing everything 180 degrees, you still have all that stuff that you've done to this point, right? True, true. But I think what people get stuck on is they have more responsibility. So as you get older, you typically, you know, a lot of times you have a family, you have kids, you have all these things that are you're responsible for that it, it stops a lot of people from pursuing, pursuing, you know, uh, a, diff- a, a career change, pivoting to a different career, making, you know, getting a divorce, anything, whatever it is, personal, professional, it, it stops you in your tracks because of that responsibility. And that's why when I think when you're naive, it's a strength because when you're naive you don't know what you don't know and you therefore like pursue and go and you also don't have the responsibilities holding you back but when naive, you're older, by the way is a better word than what i used which was stupid <laughs> well no i think i think either word can work right but i believe naivety is a strength and i believe that for that reason it's like you don't know when you don't know any other way and you don't know what you don't know you just go and you figure it out but like as you get older you have, like I said, the responsibilities, you have much more information, you have, you're more set in your ways, you're more, you're, you're more curmudgeonly a lot of times because of it, you've been knocked down more times. And so therefore, those things are stopping you from the pursuit. If you break it down, and you do it in a responsible way, depending on everyone's circumstances. Like, I'm not saying to people here, like, go quit your job and go pursue, you know, go talk, you know, basically move to, uh, I don't know, like some kind of like a tiki bar in, in the Caribbean. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is you have to do something mindfully, but also try. And so don't stop yourself. In my opinion, you don't not try because of an age. Like, don't let age be the reason why you're not getting in shape or you're not going after a different career. Everything's different, right? Like, don't let the stop be in the start. You know, it's never too late to get the body you want, the job you want, the career you want. There's a lot of people out there who look at, I had Rich Roll on my podcast the other day. You know, he was a drug addict when he was in his 30s. And when he was in his 40s, he became the fastest or the fittest man alive. Right? He won Ultramans and Ironmans. He now has one of the, the top health and fitness podcasts. He became a superstar at 45. He's now 52. I mean, his whole life, he, he flipped around. in when everyone else, a lot of people would have said he was like a goner by then. But if you really have the determination and the will to do something, you will do it. You know, I think it's a question of, do you really want to do it? How badly do you want it? How badly do you want to work for something? These things require discipline. You know, if you have the discipline and the determination, you can do whatever you want to do. And you have to eliminate the excuses of age and money and this People who are, you know, people just because you have no money and you're not rich doesn't mean that you can't have a life of satisfaction and fulfillment. You know what I mean? Like, I think people find excuses when they want to find excuses. Oh, that is good. You write in in the book, Bigger, Better, Bolder, you write, it's more important to have confidence in yourself than assurance of reaching a specific destination. Earlier, you said that, right? Choose a destination or sorry, choose a direction, not a destination. But I was curious, with all the failing that you've done, (laughs) have you ever lost that confidence for an extended period of time? And and if so, how did you get it back? Like, what, what happened to rob you of confidence for more than just a day, a month, a quarter? There's been tons of setbacks, right? Like, that's why I was laughing with you and joking earlier. You know, like, there's been so many setbacks in my life, professionally and personally. And yes, I've had a lot. I've, like I said, I, I wasn't joking when I said I failed more than I've won. And I've been down for the count a long, long time, many times. So what does it take you to, to like rob someone like you of, of someone like me. in yourself? I, I, well, I, 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 listen, I, look, I think you're awesome. <laughs> thank you. I think you're awesome too. I think failing a lot of times. I think that I'm a human being. And, you know, when 
I think a lot of times I've failed with breakups, um, when things don't go my way, like losing out to certain things that happens all the time. But I choose not to focus on them. And I only, if I, in it, when it happens, I choose not to, not to allow myself to focus on it for, for a long, long period of time and that not to stop me from another pursuit. So when I said earlier, it's like when I was, when I was younger and kind of like was, uh, I was so comfortable with not getting things and like not, I mean, I didn't make a dance. I mean, all my friends were going to a dance club, a dance teams. I didn't make the dance teams. I never got the guy I liked. I didn't get this. That didn't hold me back from attempting to try something different. It just, I feel that a lot of times what happens is when the people who are so comfortable are so used to winning all the time and then they have a failure, that's when it's a real detriment, right? Because that's when they can't get back up again. Like the resilience isn't there. But you learn resilience when you fail so many times because it's become second nature. And that's what I talk about. I talk about getting comfortable with that failing, failing. So it builds your resilience. Because resilience is really what carries you through from one failure to a next. You know, like to to me, life is about a lot of failure and some successes in between. And it's, again, what you're choosing to focus on. Are you choosing to focus on all the things that, that you failed at? Or are you choosing to focus on the successes that then help catapult you to the next to the next success? So when I failed, yeah, was I down? Of course, I'm like, I'm a human being. Of course, I'm all I get down. But then I get reinvigorated because I don't allow myself to sit there and marinate in woe is me and have that victim mentality, which can take you down a really bad rabbit hole. Look, in life, there's going to be people, and this is with everything, there are going to be people who are smarter than you and who are less smart. There are people who are prettier than you and not, not as pretty. You know, like you can't focus on what, what's out there external. You gotta focus on yourself. You gotta focus on what you have, what you bring to the table, what your strengths are, what you're good at, who you are, and not let other outside noise keep you down. That's how I've lived my life. And it's hard, but I constantly work at it. And it's like anything, you have to, you constantly have to be working on something. If you go to the gym just one time, you're not gonna be fit. It's consistency, right? You've got to be consistently working on whatever it is you want to be good at or do or have success with. Is it that you're competitive? Is it anger? Is it, I'm not the type of person to have a pity party? Like, what's the, what's the emotion that turns it around from like, fuck, oh man, this happened, to like give yourself the hour, the day, the week, whatever it is to finally say, okay, it's time. Like, what's that thing that, that helps you flip it? I don't like feeling bad about myself. I just don't like, I don't like the feeling. So that feeling doesn't feel good in my body. So that is the emotion that make that, that compels me to get out of it. Like, I don't love feeling depressed. I don't love feeling insecure. I don't love like feeling not good enough. Those feelings are like really shitty feelings. And they so, can be addictive. And I, I know that because I find myself sometimes wallowing you know, in the misery and wrapping myself in a victim mentality and knowing that like, you know, when you're on the edge of sleep and you're just yeah. about to fall asleep and you can either wake up because you have to do something or you can ignore it and just let yourself drift off. Yeah. Depression can be like that where you can, where you can know that you're on the edge of it and you can do stuff to change it, but you can like, I'm going to speak for myself, but I can be so hard on myself or down on myself that I punish myself by pushing myself into depression and things like that. So this is why I'm asking because I'm so curious, but I've also worked past it. Can I I tell you something? I understand what you're saying. I believe exercise is a great antidepressant. And it's not just my belief. There's been a lot of research on it is that once you kind of get out there and, you know, elevate your heart rate and start exercising, it changes your neuroplasticity in your brain. It changes the mood. It is the best hit of endorphins and dopamine you can get. 
Now, and I'm not just saying this because like I'm an exercise person. I'm telling you because I've seen it time and time again. I've worked with tons of people who had mental health dis- like disorders. And once they really adopted the habit of daily exercise and fitness, it helped them tenfold in that. Now, the question becomes, how do you get somebody who doesn't do that to start doing it? And to me, that becomes the problem. And the only way to do it is to do it. There is no magic pill. People keep on saying, well, how do you do this? The only way to do it is to do it. If they tell you, oh, just do this, there's nothing other than doing it. Putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation for long enough will change it for you. But you do it long enough, it becomes habitual. It becomes part of your routine. It becomes part of your regimen. And that's how you shift your brain. You know, how I became more confident or built on my self-esteem when I was younger was I took exercise more seriously. The stronger I got physically, the stronger I got mentally and vice versa. And when you see yourself getting into a darker place, you feel more depressed, you feel like you're losing at things and, you know, you're failing. If you had that habit of exercise, it will help immensely to change that brain. I mean, it, it's as if no one's ever said afterwards, oh, you know what? I'm really upset I did that workout. Like, <laughs> right? I've never heard that before. I, uh... I don't think I ever will. My listeners know that, because I, I talk about this a lot, that I lost 70 pounds over the last number of years and went from like never really dieting and working out and everything else. And now I've toned it down a bit. I work out only 10 hours a week now. And I love it. You work out 10 to, hours a week? Yeah, because I do two a days and things like that. So look at you. Yeah. So to uh, me, it becomes. So but, see, but see, part of me is like, even like, if, if I don't do it, I know I can't say that. And I like saying it. I like being the person who does like, you know, that runs a 10K on a Sunday and does five hours of cardio a week and does, you know, four strength training workouts. And like, I like that I get to say it. And if I don't do it, I don't get to say it. Well, <laughs> so. I listen, I think there are worse things to be addicted to than exercise, right? Uh, yes. and, and to me, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So people, listeners are not people who are generally someone who is an exercise person. It, it is amazing to me because what the benefits are. It's not just vanity reasons, right? It's like the mood stabilizer, like we just talked about. It is the clarity you get in your thoughts. It's you become way more productive in everything else in your life when you actually exercise. Energy begets energy, right? People are like, oh, I don't have the energy. I'm too tired to work out. Well, when I work out, I'm way more alert than when I don't work out. It gives me exponential energy during the day later on. So to me, it is only beneficial. It, there's no negatives in that way. And it, it hurts sometimes, but that's okay. I like that too. Yeah, it can hurt sometimes. And you can be easy and gentle. And, and listen, I think that like, but it's a great way to really tweak your mindset and how you think and how you see things and how you show up in life. 